ears would hear your voice speak to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So tonight at 6.30, right here in this very spot, is our annual candles and carols, and we'll uh, join with several other churches in the on the east side and uh, just have a time. We'll just uh, spend about an hour just uh, singing old carols and just having a good time together. So I just invite you to come to that. Um, and we'll have our regular Wednesday night uh, Bible study and worship at 6.30. And uh, we'll have, uh, we are going to take a week off between Christmas and New Year's. But we will have men's Bible study this week. And also, there are a few left of the uh, uh, 10 days before Christmas uh, daily bread devotionals back there. Although you're late, you have to read more than one. That's okay. It started on Friday, but there's a few back there. Feel free to grab them and uh, even hand them out if you want to. So this is uh, another Christmas day. Another Sunday of Advent, and we're going to talk about joy today. So let's uh, sing a couple of Christmas carols as we get started, and we'll start with uh, Joy to the World. And so we're also going to do, um, uh, after that, we're going to do an old song that we isn't real common. You probably heard it on the radio. Um, it's called God Rest Ye Merry Gentlemen. And it's written in Old English, and so when you, if you look at that first line, it's, uh, it's really offering a blessing to um, people, followers of Jesus. And the last line is, uh, it says, I'll just read the last uh, verse to you. It says, now to the Lord sing praises, all you within this place. And with true love and brotherhood, each other now embrace. We get that, right? So the last couple lines, this holy tide of Christmas, this whole Christmas thing that we do, all others doth deface. And basically what it's saying is, is that this Christmas time just makes everything else pale by comparison. And it truly does. So uh, let's take a couple minutes and... Just uh, worship the Lord in these old songs. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Let earth sing and heaven and nature sing and heaven heaven and nature sing joy to the earth the savior reigns let men their songs employ while fields and floods rocks hill sounding joy repeat the sounding joy repeat repeat the sounding joy no more let sins and sorrows grow nor thorns infest the ground he comes to his blessings flow far as the curse is found far as the curse is found far as far as the curse is found he sorry he rules the world with truth and grace and makes the name Proof the glories of his 
His righteousness and wonders of His love and wonders of His love and wonders, wonders of His love. Joy to the world, joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive. our Savior was born on Christmas Day to save us all from Satan's power when we were gone astray. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy, comfort and joy. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy. From God our Heavenly Father, a blessed angel came, and unto certain shepherds brought tidings of the same, how that in Bethlehem was born the Son of God by name. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy, comfort and joy. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy. To the Lord sing praises, all you within this place, and with true love and brotherhood each other now embrace. This holy tide of Christmas all others doth deface. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy, comfort and joy. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy. God rest ye merry gentlemen, let nothing you dismay. Remember Christ our Savior was born on Christmas Day to save us all from Satan's power when we were gone astray. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy, comfort and joy. Oh, tidings of comfort. Christmas is all about the first verse of that song that Jesus came to set us free from the oppression that Satan brings us. And this third Sunday of Advent, we talk about joy. I'm going to start this thing real quick here. I'm just going to give you a little bit of joy and happiness. So uh, the memorial for Fred and Mary is up to almost $2,500. And so there will be no problem uh, with everything that we want to do on the church in Thailand. So it's just a beautiful thing. Yes, it is. So Jordan, would you come light our candles? Just start where you did last time and yep, we'll start here. And just yep. Good job. Yep. And the pink one. Perfect. Thank you. 
hope, peace, and joy. You know, I'll be honest with you, I struggle sometimes with this third Sunday of Advent because, you know, I can get hope, you know, I can understand. I look at God, we look, you know, in this, uh, in the first Advent, we looked at that. In fact, we, we looked at hope looking back and gaining hope, realizing that, wow, God worked then, God kept his promises then, God can work now. And God will keep his promises in the future. You know, that's really what we look at in hope. And I get that. You know, we looked at a couple things there. That it's a time to look back to Jesus' first coming to gain hope for the future of Jesus' second coming. That he came then, he promised he would come. And even with the promise over a thousand years, he came. And we can too trust Paul said this to us in Romans. He says, such things were written in the scriptures long ago to teach us. And the scriptures give us hope and encouragement as we wait patiently for God's promises to be fulfilled. A couple things that we really need to understand as we look at this verse, that these things were written to teach us. You know, things that we don't understand very well or aren't, just part of our nature we need to learn right this is one the scriptures are written to teach us to help us learn things that aren't maybe intuitive to us that don't just come naturally to us and then last week we talked about peace the eye of the storm you know we talked last week about what is peace And we're not going to go into all that, but it's more than just an absence of strife. It's more than just an absence of war. That there is a peace that is deep. You know, we looked at this picture of the hurricane last year, or last week. And we see that the eye, even though the winds around are in excess of 150 miles an hour in this particular hurricane, in the eye, it's calm. And the Lord promises us that even in the midst of these things. We saw last week that Jesus is the Prince of Peace. I'm going to rehearse one of the stories we talked about last week. Was You remember when Jesus was going across the Sea of Galilee uh, with his disciples in a boat and he was asleep in the back on a cushion. And a storm comes up And Jesus is sleeping through this storm. And the disciples, who are lifelong fishermen, I mean, that's where they have made their living all their lives. They're terrified. They think they're going down. So they wake up Jesus and say, Jesus, 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 don't you care that we're going to go down? And we looked at this last week that Jesus was surprised. So why don't you have peace? I'm right here. He was surprised that peace was so far from them during the storm. storm. You see, because Jesus expected them, having walked with him for a time, he expected them to have peace in the storm. Jesus expects us to have peace in the storm. Sometimes we haven't learned it yet. It's not that there's something deficient about us, that we're not able to have peace, that we're some derelict believer that, you know, can't have peace. It's just we haven't learned peace yet. We saw last week that, Jesus, that peace comes to followers of Jesus. The Lord says in Isaiah 48, he says, There is no peace for the wicked, says the Lord. So we also last week looked at this. You know, what's the key to living in the peace of God? We saw three things. Trust. Trust in God. That we fill our minds with things of Him. 
we also saw that listening and faithfulness to him brings peace from the scriptures. And the love of God's word also brings peace. You know, we've used this verse, I don't know how many times, out of Philippians, that don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank Him for all He has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. So you see that His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. So as we find refuge in Him, He surrounds us with peace. Sometimes this idea of finding refuge, this idea of drawing near, this idea of living in Him seems a little bit elusive. That's why we spend so much time talking and encouraging ourselves to get away with God, to spend time in the Word with God, to spend time in prayer with God, to spend time where we can be quiet and listen and wait for Him because that's where we find peace. His peace. Here's our video reading for today. In week three of Advent, we light the candle of joy, or the shepherd's candle. From Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. So in this day, when we think about joy, we think about what the angels promised to the shepherds. I have to confess that, you know, I, I can grasp hope. And over the years, I've even been able to grasp peace in my life. I've not always been a peaceful guy. I've not always been one that just uh, usually circumstances around me drive me and, and I become more and more intense as things around me become more and more intense. Anybody relate to that? Yeah. We do, and yet that isn't what Jesus calls us to. You know, at Community Chapel, our mission statement is, is that we preach the gospel, we preach the truth about Jesus, and then we teach people who want to follow Him how to be like Him. The Lord isn't satisfied with us just nodding our head and saying, wow, thank you, Jesus, for giving your life for me on the cross, and then not taking things any further and allowing Him as we follow Him, to infuse us with peace. I'll be honest with you, sometimes I struggle with the whole idea of joy. You know, that's what we're supposed to be focusing today. And yet, even this morning, before service, talking about the loss of loved ones and the grieving that seems, it, it sometimes softens, but it never really ends. You know, we still have the wreath for Fred and Mary sitting there. You know, and we'll take that out after this month. But that doesn't mean that the grieving of our hearts ends. We've all lost loved ones that it seems that that, that grieving even hardly softens. You know, yesterday morning, and you know, I posted last night on Facebook that you know, yesterday my day started. Here's the weekend of joy, right? That we're talking about joy. And, and yesterday started with three 
hospital visits for me. Our little niece, eight years old, struggling with seizures. And two others, possibly near death. And yet the Lord wants us to have peace and joy in the midst of that. And, I, and doesn't that seem strange? Yes, it seems strange. But there's something, if we can learn it, there is something. Because, you know, we ask these questions, is there really joy for pain? Is joy some hyped up feeling that disappears when the morning fog, like a morning fog when the troubles of life just burn it away? Is there really joy? Is there a difference between joy and happiness? Is joy even real? Was the angel feeding the shepherds a line? So, if what the angel said was true, if the promises of God are true, I mean, wouldn't you think that the joy would be real and available to Mary and Joseph and Jesus? Even though she's giving birth in a barn? Even though a couple years later the king is trying to kill them and they have to flee to Egypt? Is there joy in that? I wish there was a quick and easy answer. There isn't, but there is an answer. And there is real joy. We're going to look at that today. Oops. There is real joy. So what is joy? So somebody throw me a, an idea. What's joy? And don't be afraid if I dis disagree with it. What is joy? Okay, so holding an infant. So holding an infant isn't necessarily joy, but it surely brings joy, doesn't it? Something that makes you giggle. Happiness. Jesus, others, and you. Thank you for that quote of those song lyrics. Having a happy heart and spreading it through the world. I'm a cynic, okay? And I can nod to all those answers, but... It still doesn't take away pain. It still doesn't, it still isn't something that overcomes my circumstances. How do I have joy? How do I have joy? So Webster says, our current Webster's Dictionary says that the, it's the emotion evoked by well-being, success, or good fortune, or by the prospect of possessing what one desires. Okay. Definition number two, a state of happiness or felicity, bliss. Okay. So uh, there is an 1828 version of Webster's that I really enjoy. Um, Noah Webster was a man of God, and, and so sometimes you get a little taste of that in his 1828 version. So listen to what he says in the 1828 version. He says, The passion or emotion excited by the acquisition or expectation of good, that excitement of pleasurable feelings which is caused by success or good fortune, the gratification of desire, or some good possessed, or by a rational prospect of possessing what we love or desire. Gladness, exultation, acceleration of spirits. He goes on to say that joy is a delight of the mind 
from the consideration of the present or assured approaching possession of good. And so in the old version, it, it actually gives us a little thought that it has something to do with what could happen in the future, almost like hope. That hope and peace help create joy. If you go back to the Hebrew in the Old Testament, because joy is used many, many times in the Bible, over 300 times, almost as many as peace. And, it, and the Hebrew really talks about, gives the idea of rejoicing or singing out loud, shouting praise, shouting God's praise in trouble. And so it really is looking in the Hebrew about a God-focused joy. So I come to this because as I read these, I'm sorry I'm taking you on this ramble because I have to show you that I struggle too in what is God saying? Because sometimes I wonder, wow, is this really possible? And so we look, so what's the difference between joy and happiness? You know, it would seem to me after studying this that dictionaries really consider joy as an elevated emotional feeling of happiness. That happiness can just be, wow, I got a new sweater. I really didn't. This is probably one of the oldest sweaters I have. But, but getting something new, you know, I got, a, I got a candy bar this morning as a gift. That made me happy. It made me very happy. I don't know about joy. I don't know if it qualifies for joy. Maybe. But you understand, it seems like happiness, and, and happiness is really dependent on the things around us, on circumstances. You know, if I like snow, I can look outside and see snow and be happy. If I hate snow, I look outside and I'm not happy. And so happiness really seems to be dependent upon the circumstances around us. Joy doesn't seem much different in the definitions. Uh, it, it almost seems like maybe joy is kind of a super happiness or a hyper happiness. But it still doesn't answer my questions. You know, Webster in his 1828 version had a little note at the bottom. I thought it was curious. He says, perfect happiness or pleasure without pain. Because it doesn't sometimes, most of the time, pain of some sort ruin our happiness, our joy. Whether it's an emotional pain or physical pain. But he says, happiness and joy, I mean, sorry, a perfect happiness or pleasure without pain is not possible in this life. Well, that's not scripture, but that's more in keeping with what I think in my natural life. The true happiness, I mean, as long as there's something out here that can ruin it, I just go from happiness to not happiness to happiness and joy when I get a candy bar. You know, or not, right? Less joy when I have to share it. You know, so happiness and joy in some definition are really dependent on circumstances going our way. I'm going to say that one more time. So joy and happiness are dependent in some way on circumstances going our way. Yeah, but I'm not sure that's what it should be. So good things produce happiness. Happiness is now. Joy can include anticipated future happiness. 
Does that make sense? But look at this. If you mistake your happiness for joy, you will have no joy when the things that made you happy fall away. You know, sometimes joy seems elusive. It seems like you, you can't really get joy. You know, we can't control the future. You know, we go back a few weeks when we were talking about the unshakable. If our happiness or joy depends on shakable things, our happiness and joy is shakable. So what's God talking about? He says, joy to the world. The Lord has come. The Lord's coming is intended to bring us joy. So is it just temporary joy? Is it just joy for a few minutes or a few seconds when we recognize that God has done good things and then life comes crashing in and our joy, you know, it's all gone. Well, not exactly. So I look at this. If the coming of Jesus brings joy, if the coming of Jesus brings joy, there is a joy that doesn't come without Him. Does that make sense? And so if the angel says the coming of Jesus brings joy, then the coming of Jesus has to be part of joy that doesn't end. There's a joy that doesn't come without Him. And so we find this in Scripture, that lasting joy comes from relationship with God. I'll, I'll just tell you, I'll be honest with you, Happiness can come realizing what God has done for us. And happiness can come from being thankful that Jesus died for our sins. But joy doesn't come without relationship. I'll say it again. Happiness can come being thankful that Jesus died for our sins. And happiness can come realizing what He's done for us. But joy doesn't come without relationship. You ladies understand this as much or more than the men because you understand what you want in a relationship. You understand that it isn't good enough for the man in your life to say, I love you once a month. You laugh. <laughs> How about once a year? Relationship involves interaction, time spent. And so don't fool yourself into thinking that there's relationship without time in God's presence without listening to what He says, without drawing near to Him. Because joy comes in relationship. Psalm 32, 11 says this, Be glad in the Lord and be full of joy, you who are right with God. You see? Be glad in the Lord and joyful, you who are right with God. Sing for joy, all you who are pure in heart. How do we become pure in heart? It's God's righteousness. It's not what we have done. But in coming to Him with a pure heart. There's a settledness. There's a peace. Because you see, as you probably figured out, joy and peace are related. 
in the middle of the storm, in the eye where there's peace, that's where we find joy. That peace is only found in His presence. That peace is only found in relationship with Him. As we draw near to Him, He becomes our life and love. And so then, in that relationship, the Holy Spirit produces joy and peace. It isn't something we conjure. You can't make up peace. You can't just do this as we did back then. You can't just create peace. It isn't just the absence of of strife. We can't make peace by going to live on a mountain or living out in the woods where there's nothing there that can disturb us. Peace and joy come in His presence. The Holy Spirit produces that. In Galatians we see, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our life. Love, joy, and peace. And the Holy Spirit does that in that relationship with God. That's why we hammer and hammer and hammer and hammer on spending time with God. Otherwise, we live this kind of form of godliness, this kind of a mental nodding of our head to things of Jesus, and yet... We don't have any of that peace, any of that joy in our life because we have no relationship. Remember what Jesus said? He said, in that day when He returns, which we've been talking about a lot, when He comes back, when He returns, there are going to be many that come to Him and say, Lord, Lord, look at all these things we did. And He says, I don't even know who you are. I don't even know you. Go away. Go to hell. I don't even know you. Because there is no peace. There is no joy without relationship. In Acts we see this. You have shown me the way of life. And you will fill me with the joy of your presence. You see, relationship again. You don't have the Lord's presence outside of relationship. And so then we see this, that God's joy transcends circumstances. It doesn't mean that we never feel grief. It doesn't mean that bad things don't ever affect us because we see over and over, you've heard me say over and over, that God carries us in the middle of trouble. Jesus says, in this world, you will have trouble. He says, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. He says, I give you peace like the world can't give. This peace is different. This is peace and joy in the middle of the storm. Psalm 30 says, Sing to the Lord, all you godly ones. Praise His holy name. For His anger lasts only for a moment, but His favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping may last through the night, but joy comes in the morning. Psalm 59 says, But as for me, I will sing of your strength. Yes, I will sing with joy of your loving kindness in the morning. For you have been a strong and safe place for me in times of trouble. Do you see that? A strong and safe place in times of trouble. In the trouble. In the trouble. Look at this one out of Psalm 71. I will shout for joy and sing your praises, for you have ransomed me. You know what? You can't be ransomed if you're not in slavery. 
You realize that? If you haven't been kidnapped by trouble, you can't be ransomed. And the writer of this is saying, I will shout for joy and sing your praises for you have ransomed me. Today is holy to our Lord, so don't be sad. The joy that the Lord gives you will make you strong. I'd love to have time to share this story with you, where this comes from. The Lord will make you strong in His joy. Again we see, but let all those rejoice who put their trust in you. Let them ever shout for joy because you defend them. Let those also who love your name be joyful in you. How does God ever defend someone who isn't being attacked? Do you understand that the writer of this is saying, You defend those who are being attacked. And that brings joy in me. And so we learn this. (laughs) We learn this. Joy in trouble is learned. There are a lot of things that we talk about here as we grow, as we become disciples of Jesus. I mean, the whole idea of discipleship is learning. Learning. And learning means that it doesn't come naturally, as we've already said. And so joy is something that is learned in our relationship with God. Look at what Paul says in Philippians. He says, now that I, not that I was ever in need. Uh, he's talking to the church in Philippi about their provision for him. They had sent gifts and and. He's talking about the need that he had when he was with them. And he says, not that I was ever in need, for I have learned, key word learned, right? I have learned how to be content with whatever I have. Understand that there was a time in the Apostle Paul's life when he was not content with the provision that God had given him. No joy. But he says, I learned. I've learned. I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. I have learned, learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it is with a full stomach or empty, with plenty or little. He says, I've learned. I've struggled with this. I've been tested in this. And I have learned. Look at this. We think you ought to know, dear brothers and sisters, about the trouble we went through in the province of Asia. We were crushed and overwhelmed beyond our ability to endure. And we thought we would never live through it. Have you been there? In fact... We expected to die. But as a result, listen, here it is. He's learning. But as a result, we stopped relying on ourselves and learned to rely only on God who raises the dead. And He did rescue us from mortal danger. And He will rescue us again. Why? Because He did it before. He'll do it again. It's learning. We have placed our confidence in Him. And He will continue to rescue us. We learn joy. These early Christians learned joy. Paul says, he says, keep putting into practice all you learned 
and re- everything you heard from me and saw me doing, then the God of peace will be with you. It's relationship. It's learning things of God. It's learning how to follow. It's learning how to walk in His presence. It's learning. That's why we're here right now. You know, there's times that we endure hardship. There's times that we endure hardship for a goal. Even though Jesus was God's son, he learned obedience from the things he suffered. Jesus? Jesus? Jesus had to learn? Jesus had to learn obedience? Jesus had to learn? Even though Jesus was God's son, he learned obedience from the things he suffered. Hmm. Wow. Sometimes the joy comes looking at something bigger than what we're experiencing. Look at what Jesus did here. It says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross. So what the writer of Hebrews is saying is is that Jesus, even in his suffering on the cross, he looked forward to what was lying ahead of him. The joy that he knew was ahead gave him strength as he went through the pain. He endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he is seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. So I guess we have to look at these things. We see that that joy is really learning in God's relationship, that it's in that relationship that we see peace and joy and other attributes, if I would finish that verse, other things, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, all kinds of things that come in that relationship with God. You know, when we struggle with love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, we just need to spend more time in his presence because that's where those things are built so we have to ask ourselves what are we anchoring our joy in if we feel that our life is full of no joy why are the things we're anchoring our happiness and joy in are they shakable are they the shakable things If my joy is wrapped up in my children and my grandchildren, what happens when they're gone? Am I joyless? That doesn't mean that we don't receive happiness and we don't receive joy from those wonderful things in our lives. But deeper than that has to be a joy that is unshakable. Our joy has to be planted in something deeper and more sustainable, more eternal than the temporal things of this life. Because joy disappears when the focus of our joy disappears. That make sense? If the joy, if if the focus of our joy is eternal, 
then our joy, too, will sustain us in the middle of trouble. That's why Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, he says you need to take your eyes off of the things around us because those things are temporary. We need to focus then, turn our eyes to things that are eternal because the things around us won't last. The things of God will last forever. So we really see that God's joy remains even in trouble. If the Bible's true, so is this. I thought it was interesting. I had a notification, a Facebook notification this morning, and I'm not really a big Facebook guy, even though I do post once a week. But there was a response to my post yesterday, and I want to read it to you. It was front of one of our men. I suppose since Facebook is public, I'll just say Jim Leaf posted this after my, uh, and they're not able to be with us today for lots of reasons. This is what Jim said. He says, looking at the joy of a firstborn, even after just giving birth, the mother's physical pain is overtaken by the love of a child. I remember having a hard time keeping my feet on the ground after knowing I was blessed with a son. Happiness and pain can happen at the same time. Jesus on the cross and our sins forgiven. Maybe, maybe we need to redefine joy in our lives. But there is joy. It's real joy. There is joy that lifts our spirits even when everything around us is crushed. I want us to close with a song we've done many, many times. But it's just a, it's just a declaration of our faith. That what God says is true. And that even when things are difficult, He can produce joy in us.